Whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But whom say ye that I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I shall not be moved. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. He is my defense. I shall not. Give me to drink. How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, who am a woman of Samaria? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. <laughs> Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Whosoever shall drink of this well shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water which I shall give him shall never thirst. The water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall, neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, and salvation is of the Jews. And the hour cometh. 
and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. For unto such hath God promised his spirit. And they who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The events in Exodus at Mount Horeb foreshadowed the coming Messiah. Mount Horeb is located in Arabia, just as the book of Galatians says. Imagine traveling in a hot desert and being thirsty. You know you will die without this life-giving water, and so you question if God is really with you. To answer them, God reveals a massive rock standing four stories tall above the wilderness of sin and tells his servant Moses to strike the rock so that this water for life will pour forth for all the people. In the story, Moses later becomes angry with the people when they are thirsty, and he strikes a rock for a second time instead of speaking to it as God has said. I believe this also points to man's sin and anger and the striking down of Messiah, and by his death we are given living water to nourish our thirsty souls. The website arcdiscovery.org, which features the works of Ron Wyatt, who is no longer with us, who did a lot of this work to discover the actual location of Mount Horeb, has a lot of information that you can go look at, and it again is the site arcdiscovery.com, sorry, arcdiscovery.com, and they're working on a documentary. This This particular video is not going to be about the ins and outs of that travel through Egypt and the works God did there, but it's the symbolism of what this rock means, what the rock means throughout scripture, and what our foundation really should be, because you see, these are very important times, and unless you have a firm foundation, you will fall for the deception that is coming, and it's already here. So I hope that you enjoy going to arcdiscovery.com, but let's go forward with our study. I like to use this program eSword because you can actually go back to the original meanings of the words by clicking the numbers next to them. And in Exodus 17:7, 7, he called the name of the place Massa Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Massa, while it's the name of a place, actually, if you look at the word, you will see that it means testing of men or of God, temptation. And Meribah 
while it also is the name of a place, it has the meaning of provocation and strife to quarrel. And so they're asking, has God taken us out here? Are you taking us out here to die? And God takes them to a rock that gives them living water, just as Yeshua is our rock who gives living water. Simon declares Yeshua to be the Messiah. This is the foundational truth for all believers. If you do not first believe Yeshua is the Messiah, then there is no foundation in which to be a believer in him. Peter means little rock or piece of rock, but the words this rock in the original language means boulder and refers to the truth of Yeshua being Messiah and not Simon now called Peter or little rock. By having this truth and walking in it, there is no weapon that can destroy your soul. Hell has no power over a believer in Messiah Yeshua. This whole study comes down to Yeshua being our rock and our foundation. And I believe when you reject Yeshua's words, when you reject the law that he commands us to continue to keep, you are rejecting Yeshua. You are not walking in that foundation of Messiah. He said that not one jot nor tittle would pass from the law until heaven and earth passed away. Well, heaven and earth have not passed away. And so obviously the law is in effect. I don't care what somebody says or teaches, Jesus said that nothing would pass from the law until heaven and earth passed away. And they say, yes, but he brought in a new covenant. Well, what is that new covenant? The Bible tells us clearly that God said in a promise of this new covenant that I would make a new covenant, not like the old covenant where I wrote the law on stone tablets that you broke, but I will write my law on your inward parts, on your heart. So what does that mean? That means the law of God, if you're a believer in Messiah, you've been born again, you have a hunger and a love for God, so much so that you don't want to break His law. So I have to ask you, are you keeping the commandments? Is it a burden? It sort of reminds me of when you fall in love with somebody. Is it a burden when that person needs your help and you go and rush to them and you open their door for them or you carry in a heavy load or you do something for them is it a burden for you to keep their birthday or your anniversary a special day for the two of you well God has special days and he called those days feasts and he said keep the feasts these are perpetual feasts for all your generations and for the sojourner in your land. We are grafted into the promises of God to Israel as believers. And two of the feasts of the Lord, which we break regularly as Christians, are we, we celebrate Christmas and Easter. Christmas, for you to understand, came from the pagan celebration of Saturnalia. And in this tradition, they literally did the very things that God said not to do. In Jeremiah 10, 2 through 4, it says, Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, or the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, and work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with nails and hammers, then it moves not. Now, if that's not a Christmas tree, I don't know what is. But we in our tradition say, oh, but we're celebrating Christ's birth. Well, in your mind you might be, but you're doing something God said don't do. And why? Why did this come into being? When did this come into being? Let's look at Easter. 
I'm reading from uh, Easter or Ishtar by Al Perez. The word Easter appears once in the King James Version of the Bible. Herod has put Peter in prison, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people in Acts 12:4. Yet in the original Greek, the text, the word is not Easter, it is Pesach, which is Passover. They literally changed the complete meaning there, so that we who read English have no clue that it's talking about Passover. So why is the name changed? Please read on and remember Exodus 34:14. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Asherah, the Greek form of this word from the Septuagint, is Astarte, who is the Babylonian goddess of the sea. Sea being symbolic of people, the consort of the god El. She was the mother of several gods, including Baal and the Babylonian god of the sun. These deities were soon adopted by the Canaanites when they were named after female deities, the Asher and Asherim. These deities were made of wood carved from the type of evergreen tree, and they were often set up in the Canaanite homes as full trees were cut down from the forest. I'm going to skip ahead now. Other stories concerning the egg rose later in the Middle Ages by the Anglo-Saxons, where they believed the origin of the universe had the earth being hatched out of an enormous egg. Decorating eggs come to be, came to be about honoring their pagan gods and were often presented as gifts to other families to bring them fertility and sexual success during the coming year. Secondly, they were highly worshipped and celebrated during the winter solstice. According to Jeremiah 10, 1 through 5, Isaiah 40, 19 through 20, 41 and 7, and 44, 9 through 20, the pagans would go out into the forest and do one of two things. Either they chopped down a tree and carved a female deity out of it, or they'd simply bring the tree in the house and decorate it with gold and silver ornaments, symbolizing the sun and the moon, while nailing a stand on the bottom so it would not tip over. Out of this practice came many other variations of these pagan festivals, until the Roman Catholic Church adopted the Asherah worship and named it Easter around 155 AD. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, Easter was named after the pagan goddess of the Anglo-Saxons named Oster, the goddess of the dawn, again sun worship. A great controversy arose between the Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church in 325 AD on whether to celebrate Easter on Sundays or on whatever day the Jewish Passover fell. Unfortunately, the Greeks lost and a lot of followers of the Catholics contend that keeping Easter on Sundays would stimulate the practices of both the Christian world and the pagan worshippers. So here we see that the Catholic Church brings in a completely pagan holiday to try to bring in pagans. I see nowhere in the Word of God anywhere that Jesus says, hey, when you go out there on the way and you're preaching the gospel, the good news, make sure you keep doing pagan things and lifting up other gods. I really have to ask you, are you keeping the Word of God? Is your faith really in Messiah Yeshua? Or are you keeping the traditions of man? And if you're keeping the traditions of man, then you have to ask yourself, are you loving your traditions more than your loving God? Christ the solid rock I stand No double-minded shifting sand On Christ the rock I plant my feet A firm foundation for me On Christ the rock I place my heart and trust in who you say you are. No circumstance that blows my way will ever move this solid place. Holy,
on Christ the solid rock I stand leaving behind the fear of man with Christ the truth I will agree forsaking lies that come for me On Christ the rock I lay my dream Come with your fire consuming me With Christ the rock I make my plan Partner with your purposes Christ the solid rock I stand.